And in studio, our co-hosts on the day, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. William. Good morning, Rob. Good to see you. Bill, it's a pleasure to have you here. Also because you provided escort uh, service. And, and I mean that, of course, in the non-adult <laughs> films way. Uh, for but the show this morning. It's our duty. Last time she was here, she... Ex- she said that she had certain standards we were supposed to meet. One is to meet at the door, the uh, car door, and escort in. But I was sorry, Katie, I did not quite get there on time. Uh, I'll let it slide this time. <laughs> you, were, you were, however, appropriately enthusiastic, and that's the most important thing. Ian, our next guest uh, co-host this morning is New York Times best-selling author, because they don't track the worst-selling ones, John Gilstrap. Good morning, Johnny. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Happy Monday. Great to have you here. And- and last time, before we introduced her, introduced her, I think we sang to her, didn't we? Um, we did, <laughs> actually. And I had to ask Mr. Gilstrap what the song was because I could not remember um, exactly what it was. But now I do remember it. So if your vocal cords are warmed up yeah. here this morning, it would be helpful if you could join in me. Welcoming our prosecuting attorney. There she was, just a walking down the street, singing do a dee 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 dum dee dee doo. Katie, good morning to you. How are you feeling? I uh, better now. A little bit, yeah. Cheery, <laughs> cheery. <laughs> Who else gets intro music and singing nobody. when they come in? Nobody. We've never done but, that before. But nobody deserves it like Katie either. <laughs> That's a fact. Katie looks delegate. Good morning, thanks with a, for with a pink uh, mug. I like that. Good, good touch. You know the suburban mom life of is that <laughs> is that full that is a ginormous container you gotta hydrate john okay we're assuming it's water <laughs> at it least is. anyway to get through a prosecutor's day uh, also you brought with you ray boyce from the office i did one of our assistant prosecutors um we were going to talk some about grand jury and he helps me a lot with that mm-hmm. so i figured i might as well spring with me and we have you know so many great assistant prosecutors in the office that it seemed like a a uh, good thing to make the community aware of that. And Ray, do you have any preferred music for the next time you come in? <laughs> I, I do not. I'll defer to you all out uh, your professional judgment. Yeah, fair enough. Let's talk about that uh, whole process because uh, obviously we have had a couple of high-profile cases in the community recently, and they go through the grand jury process first. And I don't know that we talk much about how a grand jury is seated. Ray and, and Katie, maybe you could take us through that process. Sure. So it's similar to a um, a jury for a jury trial, which is called a pettit jury. Mm-hmm. Um, there, uh, it's a cross section of the community that is chosen at random and um, seated. There's also the voir dire process that we would have with a, a pettit jury, but it's much uh, much shorter. It's basically, are you over eighteen? You know, are you a citizen? Um, have you been convicted of perjury or something like that uh, that would disqualify you? And then um, we end up with 16 grand jurors rather than 12 for a, a pettit criminal jury. Why is it 16 instead of 12? That's it's just what the law said says. In the rule. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know where that comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, but the difference there, uh, another difference there between a grand jury and a pettit jury is um, in order for us to get a conviction um, at a, a jury trial, we have to have a unanimous verdict of all 12. Um, with grand jury, uh, 12 of the 16 can vote to return an indictment. 75 percent yes um so it's a little different there you only you have to have 15 to have a quorum to conduct business and uh 12 of whomever's present has to um vote for a true bill for it to move forward okay right and and when the grand jury uh comes to a decision uh, this doesn't mean that the person is innocent or guilty it just means there's enough evidence to go forward with the trial Essentially, yes. The, just that there's probable cause to support the charges. And sometimes, I mean, the grand jury has their own independent authority. Sometimes they will find no probable cause on a particular charge. Um, sometimes they'll add charges. It's really in their discretion. They have independent investigatory authority. They can issue subpoenas, compel witnesses to appear, produce documents. They, they really have a lot of authority. But, yeah, just... The, the finding of a true bill is just that there's probable cause for it to be sent in front of a pettit jury for a trial. Okay, so d- tell me the difference between probable cause and, say, beyond a reasonable doubt that you get at the next level. Well, uh, so re- beyond a reasonable doubt, reasonable about doubt is defined as that which uh, a prudent man would not hesitate to act upon. So mm-hmm. if we prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, it's, you know, you wouldn't hesitate to act on what we've presented to you. Probable cause is more of exactly what it sounds like. Do you think that it's more than likely that this happened? But 
I don't know if you have a more eloquent way of explaining the, the standards. No, I think that's that's generally accurate. I mean, it, beyond a reasonable doubt, the threshold in front of a jury is the highest standard in the law in this country. Probable cause is much, much lower. I think if you were to quantify it, I mean, usually I think a lot of people think, well, it's probable cause, so it's more likely than not, which is technically in the eyes of the law. That's a preponderance. Uh, PC is even lower than that. Mm -hmm. If you were to quantify it, it's probably... 25 35 percent likely it happened whereas beyond a reasonable doubt you're talking you know 85 to 95 so it's it's vastly lower it's just enough to put it in the forum where a jury could hear the evidence and decide does everyone who stands trial has has every person who stands trial been indicted by a grand jury in uh circuit court yes okay I suppose they could consent to uh, being charged by information and having a trial, but that doesn't ever yeah, happen. Yeah, I've never seen that. <clears throat> now, the pool for Pettit and Grand Jury are the same, are they not? They're just the community as a whole? Yes, they pull from a number yeah. of areas. Okay. Now, what's the duration for a Grand Jury? One year. One year. So if you're selected, you're on the Grand Jury for one year. So they do, they, the pool is selected for one year, and then from that pool, um, uh, every, every time we have a grand jury, we do another selection process. So we have a lot of carryovers, but we will have you know, some new people every, every term. Can you have more than one grand jury meeting at a time? Uh, we have never. I, I don't know that we Yeah, can. I think on the federal level there can be, but I'm not yes. sure about the state level. I believe it's we have a grand jury for a term and yeah, we meet so. as long as it takes to to accomplish the business that needs to be accomplished. And there's always a standing grand jury. There's a grand jury right now that whenever they, they're needed, they're available, they're, in, they're convened. Yeah, more or less. So they, they meet um, three times a year. They're convened for terms, three, the terms of court each uh, three times a year. So that's February, May, and October. But... Um, they would still be available if we were to have a special um, case to present to them. We can call a special grand jury. <clears throat> I was on a grand jury for, for two years. It was a federal grand jury, uh, 84-2, Eastern District of Virginia. And the process, while grueling, it printed to me as extraordinarily unfair. It's all prosecutor. There's no, you know, every, every witness comes in. Sometimes the target would come in and... You know, there's no legal representation that that is allowed in the room. So if if there's a question that comes and the witness doesn't want to answer, or if he wants permission to answer, he has to leave the room, talk to his attorney in the hallway, and then come back in without his attorney. It just seemed kind of stacked. And there was one occasion. Um, I won't. I'm not sure which of the AA, uh, the assistant U.S. attorneys it was. But he actually said, we're going to, he introduced before he came in, this is who the next witness is. Now, I'm an attorney, so I can't answer the, I can't ask this question. You're citizens and you can. So which one of you wants to ask this question and get it on the record? So it was, it was, it just felt kind of creepy. I mean, we also doing drugs and espionage were the cases that we were taking care of in, in 84. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it, it, it is tilted. It's, it's kind of skewed toward an indictment as opposed true bill as opposed to a not a true bill i mean it is essentially a safeguard to test um to to keep the uh state from seeking indictments that don't have any merit whatsoever so um i i can see that feeling it is to an extent skewed because there's no defense counsel in there um but it, it's not intended to find you know guilt or or innocence, it's intended to determine whether um, that case should even get to a jury to hear guilt or innocence. So I, I can see your point. I also, um, <clears throat> I don't know how exactly it worked there, but uh, did you say it was an AUSA who mm -hmm. said they couldn't? Yeah. So we, we do ask the questions. We, we present the case. Um, and then um, grand jurors are permitted to ask follow-up questions from there and ask for other evidence or more information. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I mean, I certainly see your point. Um, it's, it's a one-sided process. Oh, but absolutely. 
But I mean, it's not no true bills happen. You know, as, as Katie indicated, they're sort of well, and you have to understand too that the overwhelming majority of cases that are tried in circuit court, the grand jury is probably the third level of redundancy of initial review before it even gets into. So most cases, not all, but many, you know, an officer, let's say it's a traffic stop and he finds a bunch of uh, suspected heroin in the car, controlled substances. He's going to arrest that individual and he's going to take him before a magistrate. He's got to swear out a criminal complaint. The magistrate has to review those allegations and make a finding that the charges are supported by probable cause. Then if he's incarcerated inside of 10 days, he has the right to a contested preliminary hearing where he gets to call witnesses. It is really more like a, a mini trial. It's not the one-sided mm -hmm. back room grand jury affair. At that hearing, if he elects to exercise his rights, he has that mini trial. And again, the threshold is, are these charges when everything is vetted, supported by probable cause? Then the case goes into what we call bound over status it puts it into the jurisdiction of the circuit court and then we have to present it to the grand jury so that would be the third time that there's a separate determination as to whether there's probable cause for a pettit jury to consider it the first two times i guess would be by a judicial officer this time it's by a cross-section of the community which it, is likely different from what you experienced because at least our experience is <clears> that um Generally, if somebody is going to face federal charges, they are not charged in federal court. They it's directly presented to a grand jury. That's their their first opportunity. For us, we do have some direct indictment cases, yeah. um, but the majority of what we present has been bound over. And actually, we are up to 375 bound over cases so far this year for us to consider for presentation to a grand jury. Now, the grand jury is obviously uh, based in the Constitution. Was that in the very early constitutions is something like John Marshall and others uh, incorporated later with this. So we get to hear every time the grand jury yeah. is called the um, the circuit judge overseeing um, the grand jury. And I probably shouldn't tell the story, but I always thought it was just a an interesting um, quirk of Judge Lawrenson's that he told the <laughs> same yeah, story. Yeah. But it turns out it's in the instructions for the grand jury because Judge Redding now presides over mm -hmm. the grand jury and also talks about how. This stems from the Magna Carta in 1215 and how King John wanted to um, charge individuals without any sort of, um, I guess, shield so that the grand jury was created to be a sword and a shield for the state to both protect the populace from being unfairly charged, but also permit the populace to um, do investigations and charge people with crimes. So in effect, it's, a, it's some protection that's provided to the uh, to the individuals that's been charged. If it's a frivolous charge, then it would never get any farther than, uh, it would never get past the grand jury. That's the idea. Yeah. Can a judge overrule a jury in a grand jury situation? Can they overrule a grand jury? No. Yeah, no, I don't think that's a thing. Uh, they can, theoretically, I've, I don't know that I've ever actually seen it, but in the context of a jury conviction, they can set that aside. But just the finding a probable cause of grand jury, I don't believe so, no. Okay. Do, do targets know that they're targets of a grand jury, or are they being investigated without their knowledge? It depends. Um, they can be investigated without their knowledge, but we also, um, I mean, it's very common in the federal system to send target letters, and it's <clears> something that we have done as well, um, particularly if there's a an individual who's complicit, but also a witness and we want to be able to utilize them as a witness we'll send them a letter and say hey you know we're looking into this we're going to present this to the grand jury um if you have anything you want to say here's how to get a lawyer um we'd like to talk katie a, a point of confusion uh, every time we have a high profile case like we've had a case uh, the county clerk or the county commission several years ago now with the sheriff uh and you as a local prosecuting attorney step away from it and have someone else be the prosecuting attorney uh how's that determined how uh who uh, will be the well uh i guess going back to first principles is it are you required to do this or you do uh, you pass it over to someone else just because you think it's the most correct way to do it there's cases where the the ethics rules make it very clear that I would be required to get a special prosecutor. And there are other cases where 
while the conflict might not be um, cut and dry, I think it's in the best interest of the public for somebody who doesn't work hand in hand with the person in question mm -hmm. to um, to be investigating it. So I think the answer to that is there's um, more than one scenario that calls for a special prosecutor. And if you and the special prosecutor is is assigned and identified before it goes to the grand jury, is that correct? It depends. Oh, it can be done after the grand jury, okay. Usually it would be before the grand jury, yeah. but certainly there are times where a conflict could arise after yeah. grand jury because, you know, special prosecutors come into play not only if in high profile cases like that, but in cases where, you know, someone's relative or somebody in the office has a relative who's a defendant or something like that, you know, so mm -hmm. we, um, and we have several going right now in Morgan and Jefferson, but we're a special prosecutor. Now, the ones that I think uh, come to mind, obviously, the Sheriff Harmon and also uh, Elaine Malk before that. Uh, you say there are several others, though. There are others um, with spe using special prosecutor? Yes. So, for example, there's a case uh, where we work very closely with the victim, and so we asked for a special prosecutor in, in that case. Um, and then trying to think of examples for Morgan or Jefferson. I know you've covered several. There have been some in Jefferson where an employee of the office has sons who have come into the legal crosshairs and, and Matt will move to have a special appointed in lieu of him prosecuting his employee's child. And so we, we go over to Jefferson sure. periodically. That's pretty common. So in the process, you talked about arrest and then magistrate and then on, where did the doing research now <laughs> at what point do the the plea bargains come in when is it uh that can come into play at any time mm -hmm. depending on the case so um we like to talk about magistrate court should be a funnel for circuit court and in magistrate court you know so far this year 805 felony cases have been filed in magistrate court in berkeley county um but 805 yes that's a lot it feels like a lot anyway. <laughs> it, it, it is a lot. It feels like a lot. It is a lot. Let um, me stop you there just a second. Do you, is, does your office, is your office the one that makes a determination against a misdemeanor or a felony charge? No, not unless we do it the grand jury, um, but the officer makes that determination if it's something that's going to be charged in magistrate court. So they um, look at the facts and charge, you know, what, what best fits, whether it is a felony or a misdemeanor charge. Um, but like I was saying, they, it should be a, a funnel. So 345 felonies have been indicted this year in circuit court. So um, the magistrate court prosecutors are very good about looking at this and saying, you know, is there a resolution we should reach before we get to the grand jury? And um, if that happens, it could either be something that fits better as a misdemeanor and should be should have a plea agreement reached there. Um, or it's, there's a process of um, pleading by information in circuit court, which means the defendant agrees to bypass indictment and they go right to circuit court. Um, but plea agreements can be considered um, up to and uh, into trial, actually. Yeah, during, Ray, during trial. Ray had a, a case where <laughs> yes. the, the defendant um, decided to take the plea after hearing our opening statement. <laughs> yes, so that, that was the first of, of that uh, nature. But yeah, he, he heard our opening statement and uh, they, the defense made a brief you know, opening, and before we called the jury in to actually hear evidence, he said, I'd, I'd like that plea now. <laughs> and we said, sure, no problem, go ahead. But I mean, it depends on the case, of course. We've had several cases where you just, you know, there's no, there's no fair plea that we can offer. Um, you know, I can think of one we have upcoming, um, several that we've tried where um, it just, it needs to go to a Berkeley County jury for them to make the decision. Now, if the, if a judge does not like the plea agreement, the judge can reject the plea agreement. Correct. Can anybody else reject a plea agreement? No, not, not, it basically the parties there are the state, the defense and the judge. Yeah. Now, other people could potentially weigh in, um, through, the pre-sentence investigation that the probation department does, they'll ask for, um, they'll get the victim's and the officer's viewpoint. But generally speaking, I, I don't, um, we're not perfect, of course, cases slip through, but it is my intent that everyone, every assistant prosecutor should be talking to 
the officer and the victim prior to entering into a police so that even if they don't agree with it they understand why we're doing it i'm i'm curious and i you surprised me when you told me the lawyer excuse me the the uh the arresting official makes that determination uh that implies that all of our deputies are very very well steeped in the knowledge of the law because i would think that determination could at times be fairly subtle and an individual such as yourself that's practicing law on a day-to-day -day basis would be in a better position to make that determination. Felony versus uh, uh, misdemeanor. So there are certainly cases where law enforcement will reach out to us. You know, I've gotten, oh, yeah. you know, all, all hours of the day, as, as has Ray. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, whether something is a felony or a misdemeanor is very fact specific like if it's a theft you know it's just it was the property stolen worth more than one thousand dollars if so it's a felony if it's less it's a misdemeanor so most of the time um there's really not i wouldn't say that much discretion between determining whether something should be a felony or a misdemeanor let me circle back to a specific case and that's going to be the upcoming uh sheriff Harmon's. uh he's been charged with four misdemeanors, no felons, four misdemeanors, one of which I understand is removing the GPS tracking device from the automobile. Uh, that I would have thought would be elevated to the felony level, but obviously that's not the case. And I'll kind of add a subset to my question. If you see a, 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 a arresting official that come in with a misdemeanor charge and you see you think it should be a felony charge do you have any authority at all to upgrade it from felon to, uh, to misdemeanor to felony so I guess there's there's two parts to yes. that question mm -hmm. um, and I'll start with the the second part first sure. which is you know can you talk about when you have seen something come into magistrate court and it's charged as a misdemeanor but you think oh no that's a felony we should oh sure yeah the, no we have the so <clears throat> we have the ability to swear out criminal complaints ourselves and so we can basically upon reviewing the the allegations and the evidence available at the time we can go before a magistrate and swear out a criminal complaint filing felony charges for that conduct so we can say okay no this is something that ought to be dealt with in circuit court this statutorily elementally is a felony um thinking so, like domestics that might also have strangulation right or or say for example sometimes um you know the officers on the side of the road maybe they don't have insight into a person's full criminal record and they re and you know they missed it they said oh well this was a domestic battery first or second or a dui first or second and then we look at the more comprehensive records and we go oh no this was a third this in fact is a felony so we can refile that and, and correct those issues if they're sort of undercharged on the front end but in terms of um <clears throat> so there are some some laws where they're enhanceable like dui if it's your third offense or um domestic battery if it's your third offense and there are some laws where there's a monetary threshold Demar that's a demarcation between a misdemeanor and a felony. There are other laws that just are a misdemeanor or just are a felony. You right. know, there's no misdemeanor strangulation. There's no felony obstructing. It's just right. that's um, sort of what what the law is, and um, there may be just the best charge that fits the crime. Do you have uh, another minute, Katie, or do you have to get running? I have. I can I have another minute. Uh, there's a loaded question for you on Facebook, and it's probably one you should address. Uh, I'm going to read it to you as it's written. Does Katie have regrets not initially starting the investigation and prosecuting of the sheriff before she was forced to by the outcry of the community? Now, there's a, there's a lot of layers in there, and it's a perception that I've, I've seen posted on our Facebook site before and some comments otherwise, so it's probably a good idea you address this now. And uh, there's a couple, of, like I said, a couple of layers to that question. Do I have regrets not initially starting the investigation? Is that? Yes, it's Im 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 implying that you did not initially start the investigation and prosecution of Sheriff Harmon before you were forced to by the outcry of the community. I don't totally know how to answer that. I, we, let's see, I, I'm just trying to think about the time frame there. There was maybe 10 days after it happened, I 
asked for a special prosecutor. Maybe I, I don't know what the time frame was, but mm -hmm. um, it's not like as soon as what happened uh, happened, I was immediately aware of everything that happened. I think that you know I did the best that I could in that scenario to when I became aware we should refer this out for an independent investigation did so. Um, I, I hope that everyone understands that I always want to do the right thing for Berkeley County um, and while I appreciate when there is an, uh, I don't know if I'd use the word outcry, the, what the community sentiment is, I, I think that that's important to, in a in a sense because I serve the community I'm here as an elected official to serve the people of Berkeley County um, but I also have to independently weigh every scenario and make sure that I'm within the bounds of the law and uh, doing the right thing um, you know I think one of the things in the grand jury's oath is to um, make presentments regardless of who becomes before the grand jury, not to go after anyone because of their status, not to not go after anyone because of their status. And I think that's an important thing that the the legal system um, needs to take into account at all levels. Um, so I don't have a, I mean, I don't have a yes or no answer to that because hindsight is always twenty twenty. All I can say is that, um, you know, I, I made the request for a special prosecutor because I believed that it was the right thing to do at the time. Um, I, I stand by that decision, and um, all I can say is I, I'm here to serve the people, so I certainly appreciate the input, um, and, and that's what I do. If, if you didn't believe there was enough evidence to pursue an investigation, but the community was, as that says there, the outcry or whatever, would you compromise what you believed evidence-wise in favor of the community saying, we need this investigated? That's a hard question to answer, too. And I think because it is something where I referred it to a special prosecutor to determine what evidence was out there, I don't think I can fairly answer that, especially considering that it's um, something that is pretrial and we're you know, even though it's not my case, as prosecutors, we are bound to not make comments on pretrial criminal cases, regardless of whether they're our case. Uh, final thoughts, anything you wanted to get across this morning in regards to the grand jury process or what have you that we didn't get a chance to cover? I, I actually meant to talk about um, the emphasis that we place on reviewing our um, incarcerated individuals to make sure mm -hmm. that they're cases are presented to the grand jury in a timely fashion and the rules governing that, maybe I will have to come back and do that. But um, my my final thoughts are, you know, I, I enjoy my position. I appreciate um, everyone's support. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come on and bring Ray yes, and, and talk to you all about, about the process. Did, if, did you want to cover that? We have a couple minutes unless you have to go. I thought I was running over my time. So. You are, but Phil's next. He'll, he's, he's generous with the, with the time. He's all right. I, I hate to steal time from financial Phil. <laughs> okay, up to you. But if we, I mean, sure. I, I just, we talked a lot about the um, sort of uh, overarching how the grand jury works, but specifically what my office does with it, um, what I do is I pull the jail list, the list of everybody who's incarcerated on Berkeley County charges. We actually, we now get it emailed to us weekly and go through and mark this past, um, this past session, I made a very uh, cool color coded chart that I was really proud of, um, where we want to make sure that um, anybody who was incarcerated prior to that term of grand jury um, has their case presented to the grand jury. There's a rule called the two-term rule, which is if you've been incarcerated for two full terms of the grand jury, you're automatically entitled to bond. Um, so I interpret that strictly. Um, the grand jury is at the beginning of each term. Um, so I want to indict them before the completion of two full terms because um, for a number of reasons, but I know we're not going to have a special at the end of that term. So arguing that they should stay in seems inappropriate. So um, we do everything we can as soon as a case is ready to be presented to the grand jury to present it. Now, certainly there are some cases, you know, uh, a murder case, for example, sure. where uh, we're waiting on an autopsy report 
and so we're not prepared to move forward to grand jury but at the same time that individual is not someone that we want to have bond because they're a clear danger to the um, to the community but generally speaking um, our I guess uh, order of priority looking at uh, um, cases to present to the grand jury is we try to get everybody incarcerated and then um, move forward from there to if it's been bound over for more than one year then it's entitled to dismissal so there are a lot of um, I guess safeguards in place uh, that steer what we present to the grand jury and I, I guess I just had wanted to talk a little bit about our priorities and, and how that works yeah I think I think the rules sort of dictate that there be prompt presentment so someone can't be sitting in jail interminably waiting for their charges to be considered um, but I think in fairness it, to what Katie was talking about with the two-term rule and people being entitled to bond and so forth and not wanting people to languish on the um, jail bill um, I think usually the rule is that whenever the action occurs, that, that term, that day, whatever it is, usually when you're computing time under the rules of procedure, you don't count that occasion. So um, if you're talking about how many days something, you know, you have, say how many days you have to respond, the day a motion was filed doesn't count. You start the clock the next term. So I think there's a, a colorable argument, and I think that might be the practice in other counties in the, jur in the state that they don't count the the term that the individual was bound over Katie does to make sure that we get these cases presented to the grand jury and people theoretically uh, adjudicated quicker off the jail bill the the taxpayer dole quicker um, so that's something that she's always uh, very cognizant of and is always sort of prompting us with the list and hey this guy's even though technically I'm not sure he's a two-termer in our eyes the way we interpret it he is make sure that indictment's ready or we're going to give him bond and get him out of jail we'll deal with him in the future you know mm -hmm. we, we don't we don't just sit on people katie final word thanks for having me on and giving me the opportunity to talk about this appreciate you coming in thank you right katie thank you at uh, eight thirty-eight.